having me. Um, I work at Upworthy, and like Mika said, we concentrate on making uh, issues and meaningful content that matter go super viral. So we work with um, things like body image, marriage equality, um, global poverty. And we are on a mission to prove that this stuff is just as shareable and can be just as viral as Gangnam, Gangnam Style and Cats. Um, we've been doing pretty good. Um, you can see that our average monthly unique visitors, we're in our sixth quarter now, and in comparison to HuffPo and Business Insider and some others, we've been called the fastest growing media site um, of all time. So we get people who call us a lot and say, what big data tools do you, do you use um, to fuel this success? And I wanted to talk about one that we haven't talked about in public yet. Um, I found out about this tool in grad school from my professor, Dr. Kenwin Smith. This is him. Uh, and he was just that intimidating. We were in class one day, and um, he was really digging into one of my classmates. And uh, my classmate was struggling with digging deeper into getting the answer. Um, and Kenwin started jumping up and down, and he said, don't forget to use your emotions as data. Um, that sentence literally did change my life, because um, it reframed emotion for me. Um, as not just a soft skill, but reframing emotion as data turned it into a hard skill. And it was particularly important to me that this came from uh, a male in a position of authority, because as we all know, emotion has been feminized. Um, men have traditionally been seen as intellectual, therefore logical. Women are traditionally seen as emotional, therefore illogical. Um, we see this kind of sexism and outdated thinking everywhere, um, unfortunately. And this, um, this sort of uh, outdated historical bias has, yeah. <laughs> Um, it's infused our workplaces and it hasn't gone away. The culture of our workplaces still thinks like this, okay? So um, intuitive thinking is feminized and mass, er, um, logical and analytical thinking is masculinized. And so I, I think this is a real problem because obviously um, there's also been a value assignment that's gone along with this. All things logical and analytical have been given more value, and it's set up sort of a false dichotomy in our decision making that's really been distorting um, this sort of, it's a false dichotomy of value that's really been distorting our decision making. Um, I really feel like those of us that work with big data and those of us that work with um, analytics and um, data-driven culture, which Upworthy is known for, are in danger of rapidly moving towards a monolithic understanding of decision-making. Um, and this, this, this worries me um, because I value um, the intuition and the, the emotional parts of our decision making so much. So I really enjoyed um, Cyrus's talk so much. This is going to be the kind of, my talk is the yin to his yang, because I'm not talking about emotion mapping. I'm not talking about big listening across social media of emotions. I'm actually talking about you. I'm actually talking about you and your emotions and how that infuses into your workplace culture and decision making. So let me give you an example of um, what I'm talking about. On March 21st, Upworthy um, made a video go viral that wasn't supposed to go viral. It was about a teen musician that was struggling um, with, with cancer, losing his battle to cancer. This was um, a really emotional story if you, if you watched it. We titled it, This Kid Just Died, What He Left Behind Was One Tacular. I hope you all get a chance to see it. Really makes you think about the way you live your life. The reason that this video wasn't supposed to go viral is because it had already been um, published by foxnews.com and people.com and had garnered about 500,000 views uh, between those two entities already. Um, as you can see, when it was posted to Upworthy, we spiked the video, it got 15, 15 million page views altogether. We gained 300,000 subscribers in three days. Um, viewers donated hundreds of thousands of dollars for cancer research, and Zach Song, this was the coolest thing, Zach Song skyrocketed to number one on iTunes, which is the first time in history that that's happened for an independent artist. This guy, I don't know if you can see, but he's above Macklemore. <laughs> um, and so people are saying, how did you do it? 
Well, I didn't do it, so I decided to bring to you the words of the guy who did, one of our staff writers, his name's Adam Mordecai, um, sent around a really long, oh yeah, we have some Adam Mordecai fans <laughs> here. Um, he sent around a really long email debriefing, um, debriefing the video, and I just wanted to read to you his words. I had written up Zach's previous video and it got a whopping 10K views. So notice here, the analytics and the data are saying, abort mission, this thing isn't viral, right? This topic isn't viral. A fan wrote to me and let me know that Zach had passed, so I Googled more videos of his and fell upon the documentary. Then I hit play. Then I started crying and having flashbacks to my dad dying from pancreatic cancer and what one goes through when that happens. I wasn't sure if I was biased, but the whole thing seemed timely and wonderful. We asked him, Adam, did you know? Did you? That's what everyone asked you. Did, didn't you know that it was going to be a, a big mega hit? Um, and Adam said, on the second viewing, I was still crying, so I had a sense that it would be a hit. So notice he didn't say, I was checking the data, and I, you know, it was, I was crying, and so I thought it would be a hit. When I started testing it and it broke 10,000 views, I started getting giddy. Spent the night having dad flashbacks while people tweeted at me about the loved ones they lost. Cried a bunch more. When it was at 40K, I almost crapped my pants and stopped crying long enough to realize shit was getting crazy. Now, that's not the story that we're gonna tell in the news, right? We're gonna focus on the impact, we're gonna focus on the numbers, we're gonna talk about how our testing tools um, led us to get this great viral hit that um, got us 15 million views. Um, and the truth of the matter is, is, is that it did. Like, our testing tools were a big part of this story. But the testing tools were no more larger part of this story than Adam's emotionally driven decision making um, to sit for a day and weep and test and weep and test. And that's the story that, is, that doesn't, that we don't often tell, um, you know, I find that it's very PC to sort of like affirm intuition and emotion these days, but we don't really even, we don't even really know how to start talking about um, combining analytical thinking with um, emotional thinking. So this is, this is Upworthy's um, big, big data secret, okay? We do emotional data plus analytical data. And we make room for that in our workflow. Um, all right, so do I have Trekkies here? Yeah, um, for those of you who don't know, <laughs> Data was the android in Star Trek The Next Generation, and um, he was uh, obviously um, the character in the show who you'd present the hard problems to. He would logically compute the answer and let you know. Um, except he oftentimes got it wrong when in the context of human interaction, where he needed the nuance of human emotion to really like understand the logical solution to the problem. So um, his creator made an emotion chip. That's the emotion chip right there. And um, when, when he put it in, it was, a, it was so interesting, because all of a sudden, this character that we were also used to being predictable started becoming um, unpredictable. Um, Data discovered humor, remember? And he started laughing erratically, and he was laughing at um, like really inappropriate times during his scientific analysis. Um, and then the Borg Queen came in and tried to manipulate his emotions. Um, and, and basically, like there was a lot of drama introduced in his life when the when the emotion chip was in. Um, in other words, shit was getting crazy, right? And so um, Data actually took the chip out because it was too dangerous. It was just too dangerous to deal with all that emotional stuff. But um, the end of the story is he ended up putting it back in. He spent the time to sort of hone it and um, work with it, control it, use it to complement his analytical self so that he could do work with humans in the human world. Um, <clears throat> every one of us in this room work with human beings, right? The internet wouldn't exist and wouldn't evolve if humans didn't use it. And so, um, Emotion is, is the ultimate X factor. It's the, it's the factor that you can't control, which drives us all crazy, and it's the factor that you can't ignore. You can't afford to ignore it. Um, I think that this is really you know, significant that we start talking about this, particularly, um, particularly men. I'm gonna say, as a, as a female, it's exhausting to bring this topic up. It's like sort of like, okay, stereotype, it's engaged now um, kind of a thing. But again, this false dichotomy has put us in danger of really sort of 
um, underutilizing the rich emotional data sets that we have before us to, to help us with the biggest problems of our day. Um, there's a lot of resources and tools, um, a lot of money and time being put into data and analytics. Um, we need to put that same amount of resource and time and attention into emotional data, our emotional data. We need to infuse it into our workflow. We need to set a place at the table for it. We need to make space for it. We need to put a bullet um, item in our meeting agendas for it. Don't forget to use your emotions as data. There are seven billion people in the world, which means to me that there are seven billion unique emotional data sets ready for um, the culture, ready to change and impact the culture of our workplaces. And this isn't the kind of data that you really can ultimately strip apart and understand everything about, um, dissect and, and control. All you can really do is acknowledge it oftentimes and sort of make the decision to consciously embrace your own data chip. Um, if you do this, it could get messy. This is the warning. You run the risk of looking soft or feminine. Um, you may run the risk of finding yourself late at night sobbing on your Twitter feed. You may run the risk of having to admit that your huge super viral success wasn't because you were super smart, but in fact that there were some factors involved that you just didn't understand everything about. It might be messy and it might be hard to control, but I promise you, you won't be sorry. Thanks.